Okay, so it's my turn. As everyone leaves, except for Adam. Thanks, Adam. Class is over, so you can leave. So my name is Ken Foster, and I teach political science here, and my main focus of research is China. And I also am chair of the Global Studies Program and a big advocate for global education. And lastly, I've had the privilege of being chair of the President's Sustainability Council. And I mention that because that puts me out there as an advocate for environmental protection, an advocate for reducing carbon emissions, uh, an advocate for saying we can't keep treating the earth like we treat it, causing environmental degradation across the planet. At the same time, uh, here I am living my life as a first world richest 1% of the population, carbon intensive uh, lifestyle liver. I, I use my carbon footprint. If I go in and do that on the computer, it'll show me we need several Earths to sustain the kind of, foot, kind of life that I live. And so this is kind of the contradiction. On the one hand, uh, I'm a big advocate for taking, making changes so we can get on a more environmentally sustainable footing. On the other hand, I'm living this uh, Mr. High Carbon, high carbon Intense uh, lifestyle. And so it raises a question for me, the title of the talk, uh, Am I a Hypocrite? And of course, if you go online, you can see that many people who don't believe climate change is happening, uh, people who think environmentalists are kind of these wacky people, they will say, yes, Ken Foster is a hypocrite. Um, and they will say that about many people who preach that uh, we need to take action um, and yet we still fly to San Diego for a conference, um, take a bunch of students to China, um, drive around to Minneapolis for the weekend, all of these carbon intensive activities. And so let's think about that. Am I a hypocrite? I think of three facts you know, I, could, I could point to. One is I accept the science of climate change. I accept that um, we are living in a way that is completely unsustainable, that we've destroyed ecosystems on which, we've depend, which we depend at an accelerating pace, uh, and we have to stop doing that. We have to find a way to live uh, in a non-environmentally destructive way. Fact number two is that uh, there's a lot of changes that I could make tomorrow if I wanted to. I could move to a house that's smaller and is much less, less of a carbon impact. I could stop driving and ride my bike um, here and there and everywhere. I could curtail travel to conferences. I could also curtail organizing student trips or travel overseas. Um, I could stop eating meat uh, altogether. I could do all these things. Fact number three is that I haven't done any of those things that I just mentioned. I still live in a, in a pretty nice suburban house. I still drive uh, when I need to try to walk, whatever, but still drive. Um, I go overseas. I propone, I'm a proponent of students going overseas um, for their uh, education. So does that mean I'm guilty as charged, a hypocrite? Maybe. What do you think? Maybe. And that's, that's fine, I guess, because I think the question, and I could defend myself in various ways, but the question misses the point, of course, and the point is that we live in a tough reality. This is a tough reality we live on. Um, the carbon, the burning of fossil fuels gives us our lives. It's given us what we have so far here. It enables us to enjoy this event, all of these things. And so we depend on the carbon emissions fundamentally. Um, it's woven into the fabric of all of our lives. Yet now we know that carbon emissions are causing um, unnatural and unnaturally rapid global warming and climate change. That's a tough reality. And a lot of us recognize that. So in the face of this tough reality, what do we do? And I just have three observations um, to think about. One is that we do what we can at this point in time, that each of us can do what we can. Um, we can't all go and live close to nature, live off the grid right now. Um, so we do what we can. Uh, we have to be kind to ourselves in the sense of challenging ourselves. What can I do? to reduce carbon emissions. Um, I'm wearing a shirt that's 15 years old. Okay, so that's good, I don't buy a new shirt. It's nothing though, it's meaningless. So we do what we can at the time we're at. If we feel like we're called to ride a bike back and forth from campus all year round, as some do, and it's incredibly good, if we feel called we can do that, then we do that. But we do what we can. 
um, at this time. There's other priorities in our lives and we have to keep those in mind too. So reducing carbon emissions isn't, I don't think, the number one priority for everyone's personal lives. It's an important priority, but it's there with other priorities as well. Again, we're living in this tough reality. Um, and so, for example, reducing carbon emissions might mean that I shouldn't travel to China anymore or travel other places. Um, you can do things via Skype, all kinds of things, but I don't think that would be a good idea because it's so critically important that people go to other cultures. Uh, in other words, we don't want to um, destroy all the gains we've made by coming into contact with people from other places, that foreign travel. We don't want to destroy that in the name of reducing carbon emissions. We need to find a way to do that in a smarter fashion. Um, but those are competing priorities. And the next talk is going to talk about air travel. So you can, you can tell, them, tell me what to think. Um, the second observation that I'd say is that we need to be kind to each other too. One of the problems, of course, that um, people who are passionate about something have is that we can easily get self-righteous. And we can, you know, say, well, you know, if you uh, still drive an SUV, you're a bad person, you're terrible. Um, SUVs aren't that good, but someone drives it, okay, they drive it. Um, we have to, I think, avoid the self-righteousness, um, the bunch of shoulds. You know, you should never buy something at a new when you can get it at a thrift store. You should never buy a new car that's not a hybrid because you should buy a hybrid. We have another talk on that coming up too. So there's a lot of shoulds, a lot of... Uh, you know, self-righteousness that I think is counterproductive to what we want to do. And that brings me to the third observation, and that is that the real issue here is not individual changes. And I've said this before, and people disagree with me, um, but individual changes are a drop in the bucket um, for what needs to be done. Um, we can take cold showers, individually choose to do that, um, we can individually choose to um, not ever drive a car again. Um, we can do different things. But that just means that a few people are going to be taking cold showers or doing something special, while the vast majority of the population in the world is going on in a carbon-intensive lifestyle and developing, if we look at China and India, developing in a very carbon-intensive way. Individual changes are good and important to do as we feel called to do them and as we are able to do them in our lives. But uh, we have to keep in mind that the real change that we need is change at a collective level. There's a collective action problem, right? If individuals, we choose to do something, um, others don't do it, then we're the losers. Um, we feel good and we're righteous in the sense that we're living a lower carbon, um, you know, have a lower carbon footprint. That's good, but it's not going to get us to the solution to the problem. The solution is only found through collective organizing, uh, through community efforts, we need to have um, public policies that really help us to get where we need to go. Um, the presentation just now on Germany, um, you know, Germany's doing all these things, and the question is, you know, why are we so stupid in the U.S. that we don't do that? That's really what it comes down to. There are public policies there that we can do, and we could do them quickly, uh, and they would make a big difference. Um, because we need public policies that gives us incentives to all do things. Energy costs should be higher. Gasoline should be priced higher. Is there an economic cost to that? Um, yes, but people adjust to it. And so individual actions are important, um, but we really need collective actions. We need, as a community, to try to figure out how can we move forward? How can we carve out a better um, lower carbon intensive lifestyle. And I see Peter Schultz here who is an example of a great man, but also an example of someone who had an innovative idea, have a, um, a field, some land that is a carbon sink. And so when, when Peter travels abroad, he can, that carbon sink is an offset to that travel. That's a great idea. Does everyone need to buy a piece of land and do that? No, but that's community wisdom there. And there's a lot of examples of that. And as a community like this event, if we share wisdom together, um, that can help us to make some changes, but also help us to see what do we need to do at the public policy level to really make changes happen. And my concern is also, of course, about other countries that are poor. Um, or about China that is developing, becoming richer in a very carbon intensive way. We can buy a bunch of Priuses and, you know, spend millions of dollars to do a fancy uh, renewable energy array 
um, all of this stuff. Is that applicable to Kenya, to China, to India? Maybe, um, maybe not. Maybe the really innovative ideas are in those places um, where they use appropriate technologies to get to a low carbon lifestyle, a low carbon way of living. So the community then includes not just us at Concordia, but it includes the global community. We need to be in conversation, figuring out uh, what is it that we can do. But again, to return most fundamentally, it's the politics. Of course, as a political scientist, I think that it's the politics, public policy. Um, so am I a hypocrite? I guess I don't really care. Um, Sure, in some ways, yeah, but in other ways, no. And that's the way the world is, right? It's complex. It depends how you define hypocrite. Um, it depends how you uh, measure it. So instead of this kind of question, which is a, a negative, counterproductive sort of question, hopefully we can <clears throat> decide to do what we can and evaluate ourselves. You know, what, what, what are we doing now? What could we do? Is it time to do that? Um, want to become vegetarian, my family hate, loves meat, what do I do? Get a divorce? No, right? We got to find a way to work through this. Um, we also need to be careful of being too self-righteous um, and putting a bunch of shoulds on people. And then finally, we need to uh, think about how can we influence public policy? Um, how can we as individuals not just take individual actions, but exert influence on the public sphere? So for me as an educator, and for many of us as an ed educator, uh, I'm not one who loves to go out and have a protest and rabble-rouse and get arrested. Thank you for those uh, who, who do like to do that. Um, but I like to be an educator, which for me is entering into conversations, into dialogue, uh, helping us all to move together to a greater wisdom about how we can uh, um, mitigate the climate change that's occurring and help poor communities to adapt to that. So. Be kind to yourself, uh, be kind to others, and then um, make your voices heard. We need to make our voices heard to the politicians, business leaders, and others who are critical to making the changes that we need. So I have two minutes left, so I can have any questions. No, it's always the, uh, the trade-off between you giving your opinion or giving a, uh, it's the manner in which one does it, I guess. That, no, not around here. Concordia is a good place, but in general, um, if you look, you know, in the blogosphere, other places, or in the news media, that's often a common thing that comes up. Um, and Concordia, we're very good at having those kinds of conversations. Um, and the self-righteousness, I guess, it just, for me, it's a dog dogmatism. If, for example, um, there's only, you know, everyone needs to do this, or everyone needs to do that, it, that's fine to say that as long as we have uh, kind of a humility within ourselves about that. It's the same as conversations about religion or what one believes. So a, a vibrant exchange of opinions is important and good um, as long as we remember that we can't expect everyone to just follow our opinions. So it's more about the manner and the tone. Yeah, and so what he said was very good. Wow, okay. As soon as I'm finished, they all come in. So... <laughs> This is very good that what he said was leading by example, doing things, making changes, um, and letting other people observe and figure it out. Okay, I'm being kicked off the stage, so that's fine. Now we're going to move to uh, two other people. I have to give them your thing, so thank you.